more detail at ionic bonding here in section this is 6.3 in your book and we've talked a bit about ionic bonding already we've talked about what ionic bonding is that it primarily happens between a metal and a non-metal coming together remember the key thing is there's a transfer of electrons so there's a positive ion that called a cation and there's a negative ion called an anion and they stick together through a charge attraction what's called an electrostatic attraction and they form these repeating again maybe another word we want to write down they form these lattice structures that are very hard um, very strong bonds also relatively uh, brittle so let's look at some of these uh, properties and see if if we can explain them a little bit better so the first thing we want to know is kind of how to put these compounds together again something we wrote but when we're talking about these ionic compounds remember we can predict the charge on most of our atoms in an ionic bond because things in group one remember have one valence electron so they tend to form a plus one charge things in our second row just like this shows it's a little blurry have two valence electrons so they tend to form a plus two notice over here all of our halogens minus one oxygen sulfur primarily minus two nitrogen phosphorus minus three and these are the major compounds that we're going to see in our ionic uh, compounds and again we'd have our zigzag line right about here Notice we have other metals, we have some transition metals, and, and if you look closely there, you can see that our transition metals can have multiple oxidation states or multiple different charges, um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But for right now, if we have a simple structure, and you want to know, say, how magnesium and bromine bond, well, you'd find magnesium, you'd see it in the second row, you'd know it has two valence electrons, so it's probably going to lose two, primarily forms a plus two charged ion. Bromine is over here, column seven, one away from an octet, so it's probably going to gain one electron, be Br minus one. And now, uh, for those to balance, right, magnesium, just like this diagram shows, has two electrons to lose, so when it bonds, it bonds to two bromine. Kind of our shortcut for figuring that out is doing what's called the crisscross method, where if there's a two, we write it down here, the one, we write it here, we call it MgBr2, and that would be magnesium bromide. So the one thing we do with these is the anion, its name, the, its ending always changes to an IDE. Now we'll practice naming a little bit more as we go through, but it's worthwhile to kind of get in the habit of saying their names correctly. So magnesium is still magnesium, bromine becomes bromide. So any of our anions would become nitrogen, would become nitride, phosphorus, phosphide, oxygen, oxide, sulfur, sulfide, and so on. So now when we're looking at these, remember, again, they form lattice structures. And there's just a couple different examples of how we might want to think of the lattice structure, that and that. But again, those microscopic properties, how they form in the lattice, it, it, in kind of a repeating box-like structure, well, that shows itself on the macroscopic side. So if you actually look very closely or through a microscope at uh, salt grains, they're going to look like a box and they're going to look like a little square lattice that is repeated in its microscopic uh, properties as well. So it's a kind of a case where what's happening at the micro scale, at the very small scale, is evident in the macro scale and what we can actually see. Um, one thing we know about ionic compounds that we talked about is their melting points are high. Well, just how high are they? Well, let's look at some um, examples here between molecular and ionic compounds. Now, these all have covalent bonding, right? And what we know is covalent bonds are not as strong as ionic bonds. One reason is ionic bonds are electrostatic attractions, so there's strong attraction between a positive and a negative charge. Um, that, that's helping them stick together. So ironic bonds are just stronger than our covalent because there's a stronger charge attraction. Now, notice how much stronger. Notice naphthalene is C10H8. It has a melting point of 80 degrees Celsius, so almost boiling point, uh, or a melting point of 80 degrees Celsius. Um, so it's a solid at, at room temperature, right? Has a pretty high molar mass. Uh, and so this is the mass of one piece in the structure, 128. But notice, sodium chloride has a melting point 10 times higher. Even though it's a smaller, the mass of one of the um, compounds is much, much smaller, but its melting point is 10 times stronger. That's due to the ionic bonds. Let's look at another one here, magnesium fluoride. Magnesium fluoride, MgF2, has a melting point of 1,000. 248, so way, way higher than any of our molecular or covalently bonded compounds. So how this occurs is let's think of, of how these compounds are actually made and kind of why they have really strong bonds. Well, to get sodium as a gas, 
So this is how, or sodium as a gas, well sodium occurs, you have to think of it naturally as a solid, as a solid metal. But to get sodium and a chlorine, and a chlorine naturally, I guess, exists as a diatomic gas, Cl2. But to get these to bond, well one, we have to vaporize both of them, so we do have to turn them both into gases. But then look at our next step. Um, we have to add an electron to chlorine to make it an ion. Notice this, it, it has an arrow up, but if we look at the value, this is a negative value, meaning that's exothermic, that energy is being released. So it's energetically favorable to, for chlorine to gain an electron, energy will be released from the reaction. Notice on the other side, we have to take an electron away from sodium, and even though sodium wants to lose an electron, it's not without an energy cost. So it does require 494 kilojoules per mole, and the exact numbers aren't that important, it's just important to know that it's an endothermic reaction that we have to put energy in to, to ionize sodium. However, when they come together then, the net of those two ions coming together and forming an ionic bond is what we call the lattice energy. And if we look at the lattice energy for this sodium chloride, it's negative 787 kilojoules per mole. You might notice that that number is different um, than the value we saw on the other page. And one reason is we also have to add in the, the energy cost of breaking this bond um, and vaporizing this, the energy that is released when we add an electron. So there's other things going into it. The lattice energy is purely the energy released when an ion and a cation come and stick together. Um, so how does this vary between ionic compounds? Because we saw that there's a big difference even in melting points between um, sodium chloride and magnesium fluoride. Well, the strength of that ionic bond has to really do with two things. If we look here at some trends, Oh, let's spin this around. Let's, let's try to straighten this out so we can read it. That's better. Okay, let's look at some trends. So we have lithium fluoride, lithium chloride, and lithium iodide. So this is lithium bonded to our halogens. And you'll notice what happens. Fluorine, again, is, our, is on the top of the periodic table. Below it is chlorine. Below that, actually, is bromine. And then iodine. But what you'll notice here is the lattice energy goes down as we go down the column. Same thing if we look at sodium fluoride through sodium iodide. Again, that's going from fluorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine. That's going down the periodic table. And you'll notice that its lattice energy goes lower. So one thing that we can generalize about that um, is that the smaller the element, the stronger the ionic bond. Just because that attraction is more, those elements can get closer together, so it's a stronger bond. So smaller elements have stronger bonds. So just like as we go down the periodic table, chlorine is bigger than fluorine, bromine is bigger than it, iodine is bigger than it, we see its lattice energy go down because the elements are getting bigger. So the smaller element has a stronger bond. The other thing that we can notice is, is notice this difference between, say, lithium chloride, that has a lattice energy of 834, and magnesium chloride, 2,326 kilojoules per mole. What is happening on that side of going one step over there is that magnesium has a charge of two. So it has what we call a higher charge concentration. When you have a higher charge concentration, basically just a higher charge on an element, you're going to have a stronger bond as well. Now, even compare that magnesium chloride at 2,326 to magnesium oxide. Now, magnesium has a plus two charge, oxide has a minus two charge, and we have an even higher lattice energy. So there's two things that are going to be affecting lattice energy. One is how small the element is, the other is what the charge is. So there's two things important when we look at lattice energies, or we look at just the strength of ionic bonds, and here's the general trend for it is that the smaller the element and the larger the charge, the stronger that attraction, and thus the higher the lattice energy, and also what's going to happen as well is we're going to have a higher melting point as well for that substance. So as the attraction increases, higher lattice energy, also a higher melting point. Now, let's go back and talk about some of the other properties. One other thing that we say about ionic compounds, when they have high melting points, and we look at why and, and how their melting points kind of vary as well. Um, the other thing that they can do is ionic compounds, again, are solid, high melting points, but, and, and they do not conduct electricity, which is what this image is showing us. 
But if they're molten, which means we melted them down, so liquid ionic compounds do conduct a bit of electricity. Now, the reason why is electricity is really just the flow of electrons. When we melt an ionic compound, so say this is my sodium chloride um, lattice here. I'll try to draw it without being too much of a mess. Okay, there it is. Um, when we melt this down, like this has it in a crucible, notice there's a little Bunsen burner underneath it, so we, and we heat it up and we actually melt this compound, we've broken all of these bonds. And when we break those bonds, what we have is we have free sodium ions and we have free chlorine ions. Now what we have is a medium con to conduct electricity. So electricity is really just a flow of electrons. If we have a neutral compound like solid, a solid ionic compound, there is nothing for those electrons to travel through. There's no way to conduct a charge. But now if we have free ions, free sodium ions, that broke off of here, and free chlorine ions all floating around in this molten compound, now there's a medium to conduct that electricity to allow that charge to transfer through the compound. The other way that this can happen is yes, if it's molten, the other way it can happen is if we dissolve it in water, because the vast majority of our ionic compounds do dissolve in water. If they're dissolved in water, same thing happens, is all those individual bonds in that ionic structure break, and now again, we're gonna have free sodium ions and free chlorine ions floating around, ready to permit uh, the current to flow through the system. So molten ionic compounds conduct electricity, but also uh, most ionic compounds dissolve in water, and when they do, they also conduct electricity. Which is actually really interesting if we think about it in more detail, because the sodium chloride itself, notice you have positive and you have negative charges, but they're fixed in position, they're held in these tight bonds, so the solid sodium chloride does not conduct electricity. And actually, pure distilled water does not conduct electricity. There's no free charges floating around to conduct electricity. So even though we think about, you know, uh, not taking the toaster into the bathtub or, or running out of the lake when lightning is coming out, um, the water itself doesn't conduct electricity. Uh, What's conducting the electricity, actually, is the ions that are dissolved into it. So if you're very sweaty um, and you get into the bathtub, uh, there's a lot of salt that's going to be dissolved off your body into the bathtub. Then you might not want to bring the hairdryer or the radio with you into the bathtub. That might be kind of dangerous. However, actually, if you're in a very freshwater lake with not a lot of dissolved ions in it, it probably is not going to conduct electricity too terribly well. Now, that's different if you're swimming in seawater or if you're swimming in a little, really dirty lake that has a lot of dissolved salts and ions in it. Um, but, I mean, I, it's not necessarily a theory you want to test too closely. But regardless, distilled water itself should not conduct electricity. Now, again, when we dissolve this in water, and most of our ionic compounds, like I said, do dissolve in water, again, these ions break up. They're free to move around. This image, though, doesn't really show what is actually happening. So let's look closer one more time. What actually is happening is water has what we call a dipole. It, it is a polar molecule. So we talked a little bit under covalent about polar molecules. Well, water is one of these polar molecules. So it isn't positive and negative, but it definitely has a more a partially positive side and a partially negative side. So these partially positive hydrogen ions, so this is our water molecule. Hydrogen is the partially positive side of it. They stick to the negatively charged chlorines, and they help it disassociate. So notice these are water molecules around our chlorine anion. They're helping it disassociate. At the same time, the, po the partially negative oxygen side of the molecule is going to associate around the positive sodium cations and help it dissociate. So the water actually comes in and allows this thing to break apart. So this thing with a super high melting point that doesn't melt till we're at a thousand degrees Celsius, well, we can throw it in water and it will dissolve apart because water has, is a polar molecule and its negatives are attracted to salts positives, its po partial positives are attracted to salts negative chlorine ions. This is just another image of the same, of water taking apart that ionic compound. One other thing we really should talk about is ionic compounds and ionic crystals actually being, being strong but being brittle. That if we hit them with a hard force, what happens is these bonds are so strong and so rigid, they're not able to flex. So if we hit them hard enough, 
those that will actually break them. So this is just showing uh, pushing that side down. There's a repulsive force and cracks are, are made in that structure. So if you have a structure that's really rigid like a lattice structure, well, it might be very strong, but that also opens it up that it has no flexibility. So if you apply a force to it, that force, force is going to crack the bonds as opposed to um, maybe just bend them as we might see in a metal. So with that, I want to look at just a few more examples of putting compounds together um, and again how we do it. Now notice this is aluminum and oxygen. Aluminum is from the plus three column, it has three valence electrons, so we know it's plus three. Oxygen is from this negative two column, so we know it's most likely charged as negative two. Again, when we put these together, we can cross those charges to um, see how this bonds. And again, what we're doing, we're not really crossing the charges, we're just trying to take a ratio so that the overall charge cancels. Because this says we have three oxygen, that's what my formula means. So if I have three oxygens, I have three negative two charges for an overall negative six. If I have two aluminums, I have two plus three charges for an overall plus six. So that's how we can form this compound, is because we know it will be neutrally charged if we have it bonded in the right ratio. That's what we're striving for when we put our ionic compounds together. The name of this, by the way, is going to be aluminum oxide. And again, so oxygen, again, our anion. It's always the cation always has to be first. The metal is always first. The nonmetal second. The nonmetal ending always changes to this IDE. Another example here, aluminum with bromine. Comes aluminum bromide. Here's another example, calcium with oxygen. It's calcium oxide. Notice in one like this, we have a positive 2 and a negative 2. So in this case, we don't cross the charges because they are equal. We can just put these two things together. Again, it, we can take multiples of the cation as well. Here we have lithium with a plus one. Nitrogen as an ion is going to be nitride. It's going to have a minus three. So our compound will be Li3N. I'll call it lithium nitride. Now, with that, when we go into the transition metals or the elements in the middle of the periodic table, what can happen is because they have d-shell orbitals, any metals with d-shell orbitals can have multiple oxidation states or multiple possible charges. And again, we'll look at the details of why later on. However, they are, so in the name of that ionic compound, most often they're going to have to tell you what the charge is on that element. The way they do that is with Roman numerals. So if we see lead 4, that means we have lead with a plus 4 charge. Now, lead can also be a plus 2 ion. In this case, it is not. It is a plus 4. So it is lead 4 means we have lead with a plus 4. Um, sulfide, again, IDE, means we have sulfur with a negative 2 because of the column it's in. Now, again, if we notice here, you can cross those charges. We get PB2S4. One thing we have to be careful of is ionic compounds, again, they're really lattice structures. And so what we want to talk about is the smallest repeating unit or the smallest, sometimes we call it the smallest formula unit. Um, and so if we come out with numbers that we can reduce, like a 2 and a 4, uh, after we cross those charges, we will reduce them. And so lead for sulfite, uh, you can write it this way, but technically that's not correct. We would want to write it PBS2. Now here's a bunch of other examples of ionic compounds and how they combine to make their formula. So they have the ions separate, and you can pause this and look at how they go together to make an actual ionic formula. One thing you might notice is we do have a lot of crazy stuff on here. Um, we have things like this. Oh, I moved the whole table. We have things like SO4 minus 2, which is actually called a salt ion, ATE. So it's not sulfide like we had in our previous example. This is sulfate with an ATE, and sulfate is actually what we'll call a polyatomic ion. Uh, what that means, a polyatomic, means multiple. So poly means multiple, like something's polytheistic. Um, a polyatomic means it's a multiple atom ion. And one thing we should be aware of is that these polyatomic ions are actually they're covalently bonded compounds that have a charge. So inside this, the sulfur and the oxygen are bonded covalently, but they have a charge, so they will bond to something else and through an ionic bond. So it really is both covalent and ionic. So there's covalent bonds within it, but it forms an ionic structure overall. So 
this is actually called ammonium sulfate, and what we'll see is, again, it it's going to have a high melting point. It's going to dissolve in water. Everything else that we would predict of an ionic compound, but within that are two covalently bonded ions, which is kind of crazy. So actually, let's see if we can't write the Lewis structure for some of these crazy uh, polyatomic ions. So this one is called phosphate. It's phosphorus, so it's not phosphide because it is phosphorus with oxygen attached, so it's AT ending phosphate. And again, it is covalently bonded, so we should be able to represent this structure um, in a Lewis dot structure. So what I'm going to do is, because it's PO4, and I know that most molecules are going to be symmetrical, I'm going to put the P in the middle, the O's around it, and I'm going to count up the total number of valence electrons I have to work with. I know oxygen has six valence electrons, S and P electrons, so six times four, I have 24 valence electrons being donated from the oxygen. Phosphorus has five. And then here's the trick. If it has a minus three charge, the reason it has a minus three is because it has three extra electrons. So if I add those up, I have a total of, what, 32 electrons to put around here to make sure everything has an octet. So the easiest thing to do is make sure everything is uh, bonded first. That will take up uh, two four, six, eight electrons. And again, those are just single bonds. So I used eight electrons. I'm going to subtract that from my total. Uh, if I subtract that from my total, I have 24 electrons left. Now you'll notice, actually, this isn't that hard of a problem because if I have 24 electrons, I have four oxygens. Each one needs one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. This is going to work out really nice. So six, uh, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So in this case, we can see how it forms a PO4 minus 3 ion. It does that so that everything can have an octet. Everything's uh, bonded nicely. How we would write this is we'd write this in uh, brackets with the charge outside is how we would appropriately write the Lewis structure for this polyatomic ion.